Good morning. This is Megan Davis. I'm um, pleased to have you all here, and it's a very exciting um, day for Laura Isaac Norton, who is my um, graduate student, along with uh, her committee, uh, Matt Adunian and Jordan Beckler. Um, we're very pleased to be able to have Laura present her master's research that she's been working on over the last couple of years. And she will be talking about her project in the Bahamas. Please go ahead and mute your microphone. That would be very helpful. And at the end of her presentation, she will have time for questions. Um, I will work to moderate those questions. If you can write in the chat box that you have a question, I'll, I'll be able to you. And then we'll be able to proceed um, that way with, with questions. So um, I want to welcome Laura Isaac Norton and um, have her present her master's thesis this morning. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Megan. Hopefully you can all hear me, right? Um, so uh, as Megan, um, Dr. Davis said, my um, my research took place in the Bahamas, and the title of this thesis is Reestablishment of a Queen Conch Lobatus Gigas Breeding Population in a Marine Protected Area in the Bahamas. So let's get started. The Queen Conch is known as a Caribbean icon throughout the Bahamas um, and all the Caribbean islands. It's uh, a very large marine gastropod, and it's easily distinguishable by its um, pink and orange shell see here. And it's um, something that you see everywhere you go in the Caribbean. Um, for example, this house here has a wall made of conch shells. A popular food item is conch salad, which you're seeing here. And they even have festivals just celebrating um, this animal. Which is the here. So it's very culturally important. Not only is it a culturally important animal, it is a uh, ecologically important animal. The Lobatus gigas is um, known to reside in sand flats, coral rubble, seagrass, and hard bottom habitats. It's an important prey item to mollusks, octopuses, crustaceans, and lasmobrings such as sharks and rays, fish, and um, loggerhead turtles. Um, not only that, but it's an important herbivore. Conk are known to eat detritus, diatoms, and algae, and past studies have shown that they reduce the amount of detritus and epiphytes in seagrass meadows. So because of this, um, in this study, we are uh, calling King Kong keystone species. Um, one of the definitions for keystone species is a species that has a disproportionate effect on its many associates. And we feel that this um, definition definitely applies to this animal, so we'll be using that throughout uh, this presentation. King Kong have a very unique life cycle, which you are seeing a diagram up here. Um, there are male or female conch, and they're distinguishable by their external um, sex organs. Here is a egg group of a female that you're seeing because there's a pointer. And then um, the male is distinguishable by a bird, which you see here. A male and female conch come together to copulate, and then a uh, female conch will lay an benthic egg mass, which you see here. And that will hold about um, half a million eggs. And in two to from three to five days, the egg mass will hatch, and um, the villagers that hatch out of that are been thick, and they have, or um, they're pelagic, and they have a pelagic life phase for about two to three weeks. Um, and during that time, they float um, and drift with the currents. And after that, they are competent for metamorphosis, and it takes them nearly four years to become um, actively um, mature, which is what you're seeing here. So it takes uh, quite a long time um, for them to go through their life cycle. And this is one of the largest marine gastropods in the ocean. It's also one of the most economically important um, gastropods in the ocean. In the Caribbean and the Bahamas, the first um, most important fishery is uh, the spiny lobster or pinulus argus, which you're seeing um, fish for here. But the second most important is the queen conch fishery. It's um, a fishery, uh, an animal that has been fished throughout generations. Many of these fishermen um, and fishers grew up fishing conch. Unfortunately, the yields are beginning to decline 
and these fishers are having to go farther and dive much deeper than they did before. That's becoming um, more dangerous. And past studies have shown that um, over 22 years of research, the conch breeding populations, especially the Bahamas, are starting to decline. Um, and that is causing quite a bit of concern for citizens of the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And the following headlines have been seen in recent years. The Tribune is a, um, is a newspaper that's published in the Bahamas. And um, recently they announced 80% conch drop threatens the lives of 9,000 fishermen. And the Turks and Caicos, a headline said, love to death. The Turks and Caicos battle to save the queen conch. The Gleaner is a paper from Jamaica. How the conch stock went bust. The Smithsonian Magazine published the Bahamas conch have undergone serial depletion. And the Miami Herald published, conch is mostly gone from Florida. Can the Caribbean or the Bahamas save the queen? So this is a quite a big issue in the Bahamas or the uh, queen conch are in um, quite a dire situation. So to mitigate this, there's been quite a few management efforts um, all throughout the Caribbean and Bahamas, and I have shown a few here on this map. You see, in Florida, there's been a moratorium on conch fishing since 1986. In the Bahamas, scuba is prohibited, and there's a quota system. In the Turks and Caicos, they have a closed fishing season. In Puerto Rico, they have a closed season and a daily bag limit, and so on. But unfortunately, these management efforts might not be enough. In 1992, the queen conch was listed as a CITES appendix to species, which means that um, they are commercially threatened. They can still be treated as long as it's proven to be in a sustainable way. And in 2019, the conch um, went under review for the Endangered Species Act, so it's still under review now. Um, one way that, um, or another way other than management, is that um, countries have gone about to protect uh, animals that are um, important fisheries is through national parks. So this is a map showing the uh, national parks in the Bahamas. I'll just orient you a little bit. Here is Florida, and you can see Miami, here where my laser pointer is. And down to the southwest, you'll see Cu uh, Cuba. And then out to the southeast are the Turks and Caicos. So everything else that you see here are the Bahamas, and it's a very um, large um, area-wise country. It has 700 islands and 2,000 um, keys that come from comprised of the Bahamas Islands. So um, the Bahamas National Trust is the entity that creates national parks, and in the Bahamas they have created 23 national parks, and these are um, equivalent to marine protected areas. And some of these um, reprotected areas protect essential fish habitat, or EFH. You may have heard of this term before. It's a term used for vertebrate and invertebrate um, habitats that are important for their life phases. And those normally include um, reproduction, feeding, and um, nursery areas. So um, one of the heavily studied parks in the Bahamas is the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park. And this is one of the older parks. And it has a very large population of queen conch inside of it. But unfortunately, past studies have shown that um, the conch in this park are starting to senesce or die of old age. And this is most likely due to lack of recruitment. As I said before, conch have a pelagic life phase. And this body of water that um, the Exuma Landing Sea Park is located on is called the Exuma Sound. And I'm going to zoom in on that. Here you can see it a little bit better, the Exuma Land Sea Park and the Exuma Sound. And this has a clockwise gyre in it or a current. And um, what's most likely happening is there is a lack of conch eggs being laid um, in the southern part of the Exuma Sound. And so that means there aren't as many conch being carried up by the currents and deposited here into the Exuma Land and Sea Park. So this box here is um, showing the a newer park. It's called Mariah Harbor Key National Park. And this is a, a park that is relatively new um, to ENT's park system, and it's understudy. So this is where the idea behind this thesis project came from. Our idea was to aggregate um, a conch breeding population, and um, that will be able to provide eggs for other fishing grounds and for national parks like Exuma, the 
And the term egg farm was coined in aquaculture when it was being used for the commercial conch egg farm in the Turks and Caicos. Um, which are pictures of that are what you see here. And aggregating animals in these enclosures um, is not a um, novel or unique method. It's been used um, in aquaculture quite a lot for cobia, African land snails, apple snails, abalone, red drum, etc. So um, this study reimagined the aquaculture tool, the egg farm, and um, we're applying it into a restoration setting. So national, or um, excuse me, wild um, conch populations um, and enclosed conch populations have been studied in the past. And that's what I'm showing on this scale that you're seeing here. Um, this is a, um, down at the bottom of the scale where you see my laser pointer, it shows zero or zero density. Of conch. And then the density increases as you go up the scale to a very high density, which is what you're seeing here in blue. The past studies have shown that any um, conch populations that have less than 56 conch per hectare are not productive. And when you were talking about wild conch populations, the numbers are re normally reported in hectares. And then when you, you are researching um, captive conch populations, a lot of times the results are published in meters squared, which is why I have both of those measurements on the screen here. Um, other studies showed that um, a conch population of 100 conch per hectare is the minimum density needed for that population to be stable. Um, so this is, this is just important to note that uh, at these low densities, the conch aren't able to aggregate and find each other and produce those egg masses. In Puerto Rico, there was a study done with conch, um, captive conch and enclosures. There was a high density at one conch for every 70 meters square and a low density, or, uh, excuse me, the other way around, a low density of one conch for every 70 meters square and a high density of one conch for every five meters square. And they found um, that eggs were laid at both densities, but more eggs were laid at the low density than the high density. Firstly, in the Turks and Caicos, a study was done where conch were held captive um, at one conch for every 32 meters square and one conch for every 15 meters square. And they found that they um, collected more eggs at, with the high density populations. And for um, commercial aquaculture egg farms, it's recommended to have one conch for every 10 meters square, which is, you're seeing this right here. And our study was conducted at one conch for every 5.5 meters square. So this seems like a very dense population, but in the wild, populations have been um, seen at 2,793 conch per hectare. And this is a very dense, very healthy um, conch population, and they did um, show egg laying and um, reproductive activity. So, uh, so although it seems dense, it is well within the realms of so um, our goal for this study was to investigate the effects of translocating conch into an enclosure within the historic breeding habitat inside the Mora Harbor Key National Park. And the objectives that we used to address this were to determine if the reestablishment of adult conch by translocated into an overfished marine area was possible. And to do that, we characterized the morphology of translocated conch from two breeding populations. We analyzed the change in acclimation, movement, and behavior of the translocated conch over time. And we observed the reproductive activity, which is pairing, mating, or egg laying, in the enclosure over time. A second objective that um, we had was to assess the changes to the ecosystem from translocated conch into an overfished EPA. And we did that by monitoring the changes in the flora and the sediment, and monitoring the changes in the fauna in and around. So going back to Mariana Harbor Key National Park, this is a map showing the park bounds. Um, you can see that it encompasses shallow and deep water uh, and quite a few keys as well. It's a very large area. And we were in this park studying from May 26th to August 16th, 2019. Zooming in further into the park, here is our um, study site. And this is the exact um, position and size of our enclosure in the park. And um, just to orient you with the habitat here, this area all here is coral reef. And then all of this darker area that you see um, in the substrate, all of that is seagrass. So 
So this enclosure, you can see, encompasses seagrass and um, in the back reef habitat. In 2017, this site was visited um, by Dr. Davis and myself. And um, we observed a, a female conch laying eggs, which is what you're seeing here. This strand, you can't see shell, is um, an egg mass that she was laying. And we also observed um, conch of all ages, from adults down to juveniles. So um, this information combined with um, the observations that we made in this study tell us that this is a, um, this is a, a central fish habitat for conch. We saw um, various life stages. We saw egg laying, um, we saw lots of feeding. This was a really wonderful site for the field research that we did this summer. It had um, a patchwork um, of seagrass and rubble throughout the enclosure, and the depth was less than eight meters, so it was a good depth for snorkeling. The enclosure habitat patch types were um, characterized by various snorkelers throughout the study for accuracy. And that's what you're seeing here. This is uh, our habitat map overlaid um, onto the Google Earth images of the air study area. And you see this tan area here um, through the maps. That is sand. And these dark orange areas are sand and reef rubble. And then um, the green patches that you see are different densities of seagrass. So the dark green is dense seagrass um, going up through the light green, which is sparse seagrass. And this table shows us that there um, was quite a lot of seagrass in the enclosure. Um, but there was also quite a bit of um, space for conch to lay eggs in the sand, the ripple, and the sparse to medium um, habit patch, habitat patch types. Um, before we leave this slide, I want to draw your attention to this area here, we have referred to this as the halo. This was um, at one point dense seagrass all the way up to the edge of the enclosure, but because of continuous movement in this area, um, it created a halo of sand up against the edge of the enclosure. And we'll talk about that a little more. I just want to um, familiarize you with that terminology. Okay, so um, the first thing that needed to be done was build the enclosure. So the material for the enclosure was shipped down to the Bahamas from Miami, and um, it was loaded onto a boat, and transported out to the study site where um, scuba divers installed the enclosure. Dr. Davis and I offered surface support, but we um, were not on scuba. And the end result was an enclosure that was 1,385 meters square. We then stocked the enclosure. And the original plan was to collect conch from the Exuma area, um, the National Park if possible, but um, there's areas around Exuma. But unfortunately, we weren't able to find um, enough conch for our study. So we decided to buy them from local fishermen. And there were two fishermen that we um, bought conch from, and one of them fished at the sand gores, which is at the tip of the tongue of the ocean, which is what you're seeing right here from the music unit. And another uh, fisherman fished from Water Key. So uh, sand bores were about 1,000, um, excuse me, 111 kilometers from the study site, and Water Key was 101 kilometers from the study site. And when these fishermen would go out to fish for conch, they would be out for about two weeks. And um, throughout that two-week period, they would collect conch. And as they did, they would knock a small hole in the lip of their shell, and they would use this hole to string the conch together so that they could hold them in the water while they were fishing, but also so that they could easily transport them. After we bought the conch, we uh, transported them under wet burlap. We measured their shell morphometrics, which answers objective 1A, which is characterized morphology, translocated conch from two breeding populations. You see here that we're measuring the shell length with the osteometric form. We also measured Thickness. And this is important to do because this is a, um, can be used as a metric of age. We measure lip thickness with calipers, and a conch with a lip thickness of 15 millimeters or greater is um, considered an adult because um, studies have shown that those are the lip thicknesses where the gonads are fully developed. And then anything younger than that um, has not 
has most likely not had time to reproduce. I'm just going to show you um, an example of that. This is a conch with a very thick lip. You see this is right here. This conch um, is uh, likely older than four years and has had time to reproduce. This conch has a very thin lip. You can see the difference here. Um, so this conch um, is likely less than 15 millimeters in lip thickness. This table shows that um, the conch from the sand borers had a uh, thicker lip thickness but a shorter shell length than conch from water key. So this is just telling us that the conch that we bought from the fishermen from the sand borers were on average older than the conch from water key. We also um, identified the sex of most of the conch in the enclosure. And our sex ratio was very close to one to one, which is what it is in wild populations. Our ratio was 1.1 females to 0 0.9 males. And of those, 67% were adults or had a lift thickness of greater than 15 millimeters. After we measured morphometrics, we tagged the conch. You can see that we tagged with a um, livestock tag. And we also added a secondary tag with underwater epoxy, which you're seeing here. We then stocked the conch in the enclosure. There were 251 conch in the enclosure, which is equivalent to a density of one conch every 5.5 meters square, or 1,881 conch per hectare. So um, we I divided the enclosure into different zones, and this was to aid with um, sediment collections and our benthic surveys, which I will go um, into a little bit more in just a second. I just want to familiarize you, uh, you with this diagram of the enclosure. You can see that we had numbered buoys around the edges of the enclosure, and that was to aid in navigation. And then we divided the enclosure into three different zones. We have zone one here near the 24. We have zone two, which is the center of the enclosure, and then zone three, which was near the number 12. And then we also had um, the outside zones. So outside zone three, outside zone two, and outside one. And the conch on this side of the enclosure had green tags, so we um, called them just the green side. And the conch on this side of the enclosure had yellow tags, so this is called the yellow side of the enclosure. So at this point, this is what our study site looked like. Um, the enclosure was nearly 1,400 meters square. It was much too large for me to get a, a picture. So I have this um, representative drawing to show you what our setup looked like. At the nearest point, we were two meters away from the coral reef. And on this part of the enclosure, the depth was four meters at mid time. There was a lot of um, reef rubble and coarse sand in this area. And on the opposite side of the enclosure, the depth was 2.5 meters at mid tide, and there was a lot of seagrass, such as the fossil testimony. We visited the enclosure 42 times during the 12 week study, and these were spaced over 24 to 48 hours. And while we were there, we observed the conch movements on 36 different days and the reproductive activity. This was to answer objectives uh, 1, B, and C. We did this by um, identifying the exact location of every conch and writing it on a smoker suit. We also uh, took inventory of the conch to make sure all of them were present. We um, repaired the enclosure if it was needed, and we also repaired any tags that needed. And then um, monthly benthic surveys, monthly sediment samples, um, and a one-time detrital sample were also conducted, which is what you're seeing here. And those answer objective 2A and 1B. And a fauna assessment was conducted every time the enclosure was visited, which answers objective 2B. So going into the um, methods of the benthic survey and the biogeochemical analysis a little bit deeper. Like I said, um, this was the uh, month, the benthic survey was sampled monthly in June, July, and August with a 25 centimeter quadrat. And that's what you're seeing here. In this map, the white squares represent the locations where the quadrats um, were haphazardly tossed in June, and um, the locations where the quadrat was tossed in July are gray, and the locations in August are black. So you can see that the um, we had the enclosure area well characterized, and a lot of the um, a lot of the space was 
covered with the quadrupters. Um, and during this appendix survey, we were analyzing the density of seagrasses and macroalgae. And then um, for the sediment biogeochemical um, analysis, we had um, an N of two, meaning that we collected two samples inside each zone and outside each zone in the enclosure. And for this, we were measuring the sediment grain size, the total organic content of the sediment, and the solid, solid phase of the carbonate. At the end of the study, we um, conducted gonad sampling, which is what you're seeing here. 75 of the cones were sacrificed to analyze their gonads for reproductive readiness. This is a male gonad that you're seeing here with the orange. Female gonads are this cream color. And then this is um, how the gonads were uh, sampled for histology. So now I would like to move into the results and the discussion of our study. And just to remind you, the goal of this study was to investigate the effects of translocating conch, of um, adult conch, into an enclosure within a historic breeding um, habitat inside the Maya Harbor Key National Park. And our objectives to do this was to determine if reestablishment of adult conch by translocated into an overfished and cave was possible. And our second objective was to assess the changes in the ecosystem from translocating conch into an overfished and cave area. So um, our goal was met. It was determined that um, conch could be translocated into this historic breeding habitat. And, um, and their survival was very high. We had 98% survival, which is very good to see. And we also saw quite a benefit to um, the seagrass meadow where the conch were. That was a very positive thing that we saw from the translocation. We had expected to see egg masses being laid this summer, um, but none were laid, which is puzzling. Um, so during this um, discussion and the, and the result, I'm going to go through some other studies that were similar to this and showed egg laying, comparing them to our study. So um, I'm also going to be presenting some of the inter uh, interesting environmental changes that we saw as well. I'm going to start with temperature because um, temperature is an environmental trigger for pink bloom. And that's what you're seeing in this graph here. On the y axis is the temperature in degrees Celsius, and the x axis is the um, date. And we used a Hobo uh, data logger from onset to monitor the maximum and minimum daily temperatures, which is recorded here in this graph. The maximum is this dark gray line, and then the minimum temperature that we saw is this light gray line. So our temperature range was 27.4 to 32.6 degrees Celsius. And this is comparable to um, the Turks and Caicos study that I talked about before. And their temperature range was 27 degrees Celsius to 31.5. And uh, those temperatures are represented by these red lines here. So you can see that most of our temperature um, is between these confines. And then in the Puerto Rico study I talked about before, the average temperature was 30.3 degrees Celsius, which is that blue line. So um, because of this past literature, it's not likely that temperature was the reason that they come from the areas in the summer. So moving into our biogeochemical results, and as you remember, we measured um, the organics in the sediment and the carbonate composition with loss on ignition, which is being recorded um, at the top of the table here. I'd like to bring your attention to the organic measurements. Uh, in the Bahamas, there, uh, a range of organics was found in the enclosure study that was 2.7 to 4.4 percent rate. And you can see that our measurements are within those ranges. There was uh, quite a bit of carbonate in the sediment. The Bahamas are known for this. And um, this is uh, important because conch use carbonate for shell building. The results of the uh, grain size analysis are shown at the bottom part of this table. You can see that the mean and standard deviation of the samples were reported here. And then the classification of the mean, the sorting, which means how 
um, homogeneous each sample was. It was very homogeneous, it was well sorted. There were many particles that were various sizes, it was well sorted. And then the green size skewness, which um, shows if the sample is biased towards one type of sample or another. So you can see in um, the zones one and two, um, the mean classification showed fine sand, but those were both uh, monetary, monetary to poorly sorted, and it was very uh, coarsely skewed. So we know that there were um, there, there were lots of coarse sand out in the sample for the comp, and this is important to note because that is what the comp prefer when they are laying eggs: is this coarse sand. So. Um, because of this and the comparisons to the past studies, it's unlikely that the, uh, the sediment was in the um, contents of the sediment were the reason that the egg was sampled. Moving into our benthic survey results, as a reminder, these were also taken um, every, uh, every month in June, July, and August. And this is a table that's showing the frequency that each of these seagrass species or macroalgae species were observed. So the Thalassia testudium was observed 66.3% of the times that a quadrat was thrown in the month of July. So you can um, see that it was very common to see um, Thalassia testudium, Syringonium filiforme, Calendulli rodetti, and Batophora. Um, other popular uh, species that we saw in the enclosure were Halomedia, Rhyphocephalus, Eudotia, and Lorenziopi. So, um, in going into um, this benthic survey a little bit deeper, we were comparing the densities of the seagrass between zones, or excuse me, not between zones, um, between the inside zone and the outside zone, and also over time to see if the conch had an effect on the density of the seagrass. And what we found is that there was no significant difference. There was no change in the density of seagrasses throughout time or between the inside and outside of the enclosure. So that's good to note that the comp did not have a negative effect, even though we have such a high density of being in this enclosure. Moving into our benthic survey results um, of, the, uh, of the detritus sampling. Here you see that we threw a quadrat and it had inside of it, which is this um, dark, or this light tan color. And then um, the detritus was collected and dried in an oven. And the detritus sampling was only done in um, section three and um, the bottom section of two, or of zone two, where there was quite a bit of thick seagrass. And we compared um, these, rows, um, these densities of the detritus inside and outside the enclosure these zones and we found um, that there was no significant effect. And this is important because this detritus is an important conch food source and past studies have shown that holding conch at a high density can help them produce the food inside their enclosure. So we know that there, um, there was still quite a bit of food available to them. Another important food source for conch are epiphytes as we talked about before. And although um, we did not measure the um, amount of epiphytes um, on the seagrasses in the study, we did measure it thick poorly. And so that's what I'm going to be showing here. So you can see um, that at first there were not very many epiphytes on the enclosure structure. But over time, it started to grow quite a bit. And this is week eight. And by week 10, there's quite a bit of growth in the enclosure structure. And by week 12, there's a surprising amount of epiphytes that you see here. But I'd like to note that um, you can tell how far up the comp reach because um, this whole area of the enclosure is clean and free of the pipes from where the comp have been eating them. So just another view of this. This is a top-down view, and this is the outside of the enclosure. And you can see that there are quite a bit more epiphytes and detritus outside of the enclosure than there were inside the enclosure. So um, so although there was a visual difference in epiphytes and detritus, there was no significant difference. And um, from this, we concluded that um, the lack of food is not likely the reason um, for the lack of reproductive behavior in the study. We do know that the comp were using this energy that they were um, gaining, um, feeding, for 
something, uh, you can see here that this conch has quite a bit of shell growth all around its lip. And most of the conch healed the hole that was in their lip um, after about four to five weeks in cycle. Interesting observation. Now I'm going to move into the kernel density um, distribution analysis, um, which is what you were seeing here. And these are analyses that take spatial data and they calculate where the highest percentage of um, measurements are and then the next highest percentage and so on. And that's what you're seeing in these maps. So, like I said before, um, movement data was taken in each location was measured every 24 to 48 hours and for these kernel density distributions two weeks of that data was compiled for each month so each of these black dots that you see on this map here represent one conch uh, on one specific day so what i want to draw your attention to in june is this red area um, against the edge of the enclosure here and this is um, the continuous movement in the heavy track that I was talking about earlier that ended up creating the halo area. Um, and something that happened between June and July is all the conch started to um, heal up their holes. And so it seems that there was, um, there was a connection between the time that many of the conch healed their holes and then the time that they started moving out towards um, deeper parts of the enclosure, which is what you're seeing in July. And then in August, you can see that the conch um, really spread out and started to utilize their entire um, habitat that was available to them. So um, I'm going to show you a different habitat analysis to kind of understand this better. This is a resource selection analysis where the resource in this study was habitat. Um, and these bars show the different habitat types inside of the enclosure, and I've divided it by um, the yellow side of the enclosure and the green side. And this was measured against um, if all the conch were evenly distributed throughout the enclosure. And uh, that was what the base measurement was. And then um, if more conch were found in an area than expected, then it was said that they preferred that area. And if less conch were found than expected, and if they, it was said that they avoided the area. And if there was no significant difference, then the conch were indifferent to that area, um, which is what these open bars are saying. So um, just to point out a few patterns, it seems through the month of July, conch um, preferred the halo area, which is what you're seeing um, in these gray bars, these plus signs. And at the same time, they seem to avoid the sandy areas and the reef level areas. Um, so this is really interesting and this uh, similar behavior was observed on the green side of the enclosure which is what you're seeing here. There was a preference for the halo um, and avoidance for thin, or sparse seagrass as well as avoidance of um, the sand and reef rubble areas. So um, as the summer went on throughout July and August, the conch um, did not have very many preferences for avoidances for habitat, so you um, pretty indifferent. Uh, really interesting note, and it's good to know that the conch were utilizing their entire habitat. So I'm bringing back this um, scale that we talked about earlier, the density um, from zero to a very high density of conch. So we know um, that temperature is likely not the reason for conch laying eggs, and it's not likely the reason for um, that they did not have enough food. So it's possible that the density was too, um, too high in the enclosure. But we've seen in past studies that eggs were laid um, in enclosures at various densities, and that natural populations can be very dense, and they see, um, they see egg laying as well. So it's likely not um, an issue with density. And past studies have put conchy enclosures much, much smaller than ours. Um, one very small enclosure reported was 28.3 meters square. And um, the enclosure that we used was nearly 1,400 meters square, which is 50 times larger. And our 
enclosure size is similar to the one used in Turks and Caicos, which um, produced quite a bit of eggs. So it's unlikely that density or area was the reason that the colonies died out the eggs. So moving into um, the fauna observations, um, translocating these conch into an overfished area correlated with some um, really interesting results. And we were really surprised by the number of fauna that were seen um, in and around the egg farm. And this is an additional benefit to the ecosystem other than the grazing that the conch can provide. So on this graph here, you see the accumulation of um, the fauna observations. This is total number of species observed on the y-axis by date on the x-axis. And fifth, or 49 species were observed um, during this study. And in this graph, I had them divided into class. There were 11 um, classes, um, just so that you could see this easier. And you can see that over time, there's a general um, positive trend where the more animals were um, coming inside the enclosure and around the enclosure. Um, so this is um, not surprising because conch is a popular prey item. Um, this data could also be slightly biased because um, us as observers could have gotten better at observing animals and identifying animals over time. But increasing, uh, interestingly, we did not see the same trend with the microfauna in the enclosure. Um, this small snail is um, popular on the seagrass blades. It's part of the Cervinthidae family. And um, we collected snails inside the enclosure and outside the enclosure while we were doing our detrital sampling. And less of these snails were found inside the enclosure than outside, but the difference was not significant. So to um, understand if the um, fauna observations that were made inside the enclosure were um, were characterizing the area well. A species analysis curve was uh, produced in Primer, which is a program that uses permutations to, um, to conduct these models. So you see here on the, sorry about that. On the y-axis, you can see that we have novel species, and then on the x-axis, you see that this is um, time and dates. And just to remind you, the number of um, species that we observed in total was 49, and the model predicted that the maximum number of species um, in this area was 49.88. So we were able to characterize 98% of the fauna population inside this area, given the sampling method that we used. Um, so, so this is, um, this is a pretty positive result. I'm just going through to show you some of the different animals that we um, saw throughout the enclosure. And for our invertebrates, going from left to right, we have a horse conch, a helmet with a sea biscuit, and um, this last picture on the right is an octopus feeding on a conch. This was the only conch that we uh, lost to predation, which was um, the aggressive. And then um, for the vertebrates, we have um, a southern ray, a barracuda, which you see in the middle picture, and then quite a few green sea turtles. So why didn't the conch lay eggs in the enclosure? It appeared that all the conditions were right for egg laying when compared to other studies. So it's still pretty puzzling why these conch didn't reproduce. But they did have two weeks of very intense handling by fishers in addition to the handling um, that we did to tag them. So it's possible that the conch, um, going through this stressful time, resorbed their gonads. And this has been seen um, in the Florida Keys, where the near shore conch were going through some environmental stress and they regained their reproductive capabilities three months after being translocated into um, a deeper offshore site. So um, to test this theory, we did take the gonad samples, which we talked about in the methods, but unfortunately before we were able to export them to the United States, there was a moratorium on exporting samples. And so those results um, are coming soon. So our, um, our speculation is that these conch were regaining reproductive readiness and, um, and that's what the histology 
results, what I've shown. But um, despite this, we did see that the queen conch um, was definitely a keystone herbivore. We saw some pretty convincing evidence for this. There was um, quite a benefit to the seagrass. And we know that, um, or that uh, grazing in um, keeping seagrass clear of other fights allows the seagrass to buffer nutrients and filter suspended particles, um, which is very beneficial for nearby coral reefs. And then we also had a diverse community of fauna being attracted into the system. And this was possibly because um, this is a popular prey item, but also grazers were attracted into the enclosure and in eating the epiphytes um, off of the conch and the enclosure material. And also some of the fauna utilized the enclosure structure, which is what you're seeing here, this juvenile hind just um, needed a place for a habitat and shelter. So in conclusion, there is still a need for innovative solutions to conserve conch breeding populations. And this can be done inside MPAs, like was shown in this study. New MPAs can be created that protect conch um, essential fish habitat. But also the egg farm method um, that we proposed here does show promise for restoration. And conch breeding populations must be protected if the longevity of the species is going to be kept and um, there's going to be conch for future generations of citizens of the Caribbean and Bahamas. In the future, we recommend that studies replicate um, this egg farm, but also have multiple egg farms um, during the study and that they collect the conch very carefully and mindfully and do it much earlier in the breeding season so that the conch have time to adjust and, um, and prepare their shells and feed and get acclimated to the area. So um, with that, I would like to thank the partners that worked on this project with us, especially the Exuma Foundation, the Bahamas National Trust, the Department of Marine Resources Fisheries, Dive Exuma, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. Specifically, I want to um, thank Catherine Booker as the co-PI on this project, and CJ Taylor, who was the Exuma Foundation intern that helped me take all of um, my data. I'd also like to thank my um, advisor, Dr. Megan Davis, and the committee members, Drs. Matt Ajemian and Jordan Beckler, for guiding me through this process. I'd like to thank Dr. Alan Stoner for um, giving advice throughout all of mine and Dr. Davis's research. And I'd also like to thank Bo Bodart for capturing our study on film as part of the documentary as for the local prompt. So with that, I will take any questions. I'm off mute and give Laura a great applause. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> so uh, we would like to open up now to questions uh if you could send me a message that you have a question um not so much the question but that you'd like to ask a question um i can on you and i think we can work on that way to ask uh, Laura a question. If you do, why don't you just go ahead and go off mic and ask the question directly. Any questions for Laura? Hi, Laura. This is Clay Cook. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Who's speaking? Clay Cook. Hello, Clay. Um, just one question. Um, you showed some initial measurements of shell length and lip thickness. Um, did, did that change at the end of your study? Um, did not measure the end lip thickness and shelling for all the conch. We do have a subset of that information, and that has yet to be analyzed. But that's a very good question. It's something that um, 
that many people have asked us. Yes. Okay, thank you. like to ask a question directly to Laura. Hi, Laura. This is Pam from the library. Um, just a quick Hi. question. Hi. Are you going to return to the site again to see if there's any um, further egg laying and reproduction or is the site been disbanded or what, what's happened to the site? That's a good question, Pam. Um, thank you for that. So, um, unfortunately, the enclosure did have to be taken out of the water. Um, right after Hurricane Dorian, because the, the site did not get a direct hit, but the um, the energy and from the waves was um, causing issues. So we did take that out so that um, it did not harm the ecosystem. And um, future studies have um, already been starting to be planned, but unfortunately with the current situation, we can't travel right now. So um, all of those plans are on hold, but it, it's hoped that um, the Exuma Foundation does continue this project and um, continue to put their farms in Mariah Harbor Key National Park. Hey, Laura. It's Hi, it's Madeline. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, so my question is, in these plans for the future studies, are they planning a longer term study? It sounded like it was potential that the conch would have reproduced if they were given more time than three months. Yeah, that's our hope that they would have reproduced um, given more time. And those conch are still in, in the uh, national park, so they, they might do that on their own. Um, it's my understanding that the future studies will be able to take place for a lot longer since the Zoom Foundation is based in Georgetown and they have access to a boat and are able to go and um, monitor that for a longer period of time. Great, thanks. Questions? Laura. A round of applause for Laura and she's now going to meet with her committee um, to discuss her project in more depth. Thank you all for joining her today. Thank you. Thank you.